there are people that look at the neurobiology of, of uh, improvisation. There are people that are involved in using improvisation in teaching science and to direct their research. And we're going to hear many other examples. So I want to first start with George Lewis. George is the, uh, let's get the right name here, the Edwin H. Case Professor of American Music here in the music school. Uh, jazz performer himself uh, on the trombone. Uh, absolutely outstanding. The first time I heard George, he was giving the university lecture here at Columbia. And his topic, which I think is more or less what his topic was going to be here, was improvisation as a way of life. It was very, very nice. So George, it's now up to you. Well, I had a title for this. Uh, um, it's sort of it's sort of very political. The title was something like, uh, "I'm not a scientist, but you know, that's one of those climate change things, you know, that you hear about in the Republican uh, Party." But <laughs> did I say that? Anyway, no. Um, <laughs> um, now the real bit of the talk. Uh, it, it's about science and improvisation. And am I talking very well? Is this? Oh, just kind of. Um, is, is there any, yeah, you have sound. There you go. It's not going to come up. But, um, in preparing for this evening, I ran across an essay called The Seven Pillars of Life, which is an intriguing think piece published in Science in 2002 by Daniel Koshlin, Jr., who's a biochemist who served as the editor of the journal Science from 1985 to 1995, and who was probably known personally by some people in this audience before he passed away in 2007. Now, Koshlin was born in 1920, and he undoubtedly lived through scientific cycles in which everything his field took as settled wisdom turned out to be wrong. I think there's a 10-year cycle in there. Everyone said, well, no, that didn't work out. We're going to have to rethink everything. And in this piece, Koshlin expressed unease with his own succinct, consensual definition of life which posited, quote, a living organism as an organized unit which can carry out metabolic reactions, defend itself against injury, respond to stimuli, and has the capacity to be at least a partner in reproduction. So he wasn't that excited about that. And, and you know, this is one of those things that happens when you reach a certain stage in your life where you decide, how can we do better? I'm reaching the stage where I'm older now. I can think through a lot of things. And what he, he offered in this piece, a set of seven pillars, he called them, essential principles that life on Earth has implemented. Now, these seven principles are interdependent, but I want to start with the first two principles, which for many people might seem to stand in an agonistic uh, relation to each other. Uh, Koshlin's first pillar was, of life was program. A program being an organized plan that describes both the ingredients of life themselves and the kinetics of the interactions among ingredients as the living system persists through time. That's speaking from him. Koshlin saw DNA as such a program. Uh, the second pillar he called improvisation, and improvisation for Koshlin was a bit like you would call that an update today. He says, because a living system will inevitably be a small fraction of the larger universe in which it lives, it will not be able to control all the changes and vicissitudes of its environment. So it must have some way to change its program. In our current living system, such changes can be achieved by a process of mutation plus selection that allows programs to be optimized for new environmental challenges that are to be faced. And uh, then there's the sixth pillar, which is actually another form of improvisation, which he calls adaptability. But at a moment-to-moment -moment temporal scale, on his view, uh, improvisation is too slow, as he says, for many of the enviro environmental hazards that a living organism must face. For example, a human who puts his hand into a fire has a painful experience that might be selected against in evolution, but the individual needs to withdraw his hand from the fire immediately to live appropriately thereafter. Improvisation is a mechanism to change the fundamental program, while adaptability is a behavioral response that is part of the program. 
Well, I was struck by certain similarities between that essay and another one to which I've taken frequent recourse over the years, uh, the essay uh, titled Simply Improvisation by the philosopher Gilbert Ryle, which he wrote in 1976. And, the, and Ryle begins by reminding us of, quote, the familiar and unaugust sorts of improvisations, which just qua thinking beings, we all essay every day of the week, indeed in every hour of the waking day, end quote. Ryle invokes the quotidian in a way that translates, I feel, Koshland's notion of adaptability into a near universal register as he asserts, again quoting, if the normal human is not at once improvising and improvising warily, he is not engaging his somewhat trained wits in some momentarily live issue, but perhaps acting from sheer unthinking habit. So thinking, I now declare quite generally, is at the least the engaging of partly tra trained wits in a partly fresh situation. It is the pitting of an acquired competence or skill against an unprogrammed opportunity, obstacle, or hazard. It's a bit like putting some new wine into old bottles. Now, that's a very interesting definition of improvisation. Now, once upon a time, at least in musical scholarship, and I'll move a bit toward that, constructing a definition of improvisation seemed much more straightforward and certainly not connected with thinking or, or fundamental life processes. The Oxford def Dictionary of Music's pithy definition was typical, framing improvisation as a performance conducted, quote, according to the inventive whim of the moment, i.e. without a written or printed score and not from memory. Now, this definition, of course, we've all heard it. It, it, it. it tracks a widely held view, but it does tend to privilege individual expression and performance over such other crucial aspects of the improvisative experience, attention, listening, and dialogue. And it also implicitly draws upon an ideologically driven dialectic between improvisation and composition reflecting improvisation's fraught status in Western classical music history and culture. So on this view, I think improvisation could really have little or no effect on any fundamental program. It would be unable to instantiate any radical change on any time scale. This kind of impotence appears built into the vernacular view of improvisation, and maybe not by coincidence. I mean, for the alternative frames, improvisation is a near overwhelmingly powerful force delineating an unstable world ruled by a dangerous hybrid of agency and determinacy, indeterminacy that produces an eternally recurrent transformation of both other and self. Now, remarkably, neither Ryle nor Koshlin mentioned music at all. Um, and that's an omission that I think is more strategic than unmindful. I mean, to do so could have been a distraction on many levels from matters uh, other matters of intellectual and scientific concern. While musical improvisation continues to serve as a model for how various fields of scholarship pursue the identification and theorization of improvisative structure and function in human endeavor more generally, once we join Ryle and Koshlin in exploring non-musical modes of improvisation, we also leave behind certain long-standing models of creativity in favor of a more prosaic approach one whose implications for scientific engagement with improvisation I'd like to explore um, for the rest of this brief essay. Um, often enough, impro musical improvisation is portrayed as an immediate and even unmediated, spontaneous, intuitive creation in real time, a welcome celebration of the moment that bears significant analogs to everyday experience. The best musical improvisations are said to be unique, they avoid stagnation in the commonplace. They constantly display or embody novelty, freshness, surprise, innovation, and originality, all via the recombination of existing elements, uh, the cast down your bucket where you are theory of improvisation, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, in contrast, however, two organizational scientists, Kathleen McGinn and Angela Keros, defined improvisation as a kind of negotiation quote, a coherent sequence of relational, informational, and procedural actions and responses created, chosen, and carried out by the parties during the social interaction, unquote. Now, I find this prosaic and provisional definition expands the frame of reference beyond the artistic and places considerable pressure on ideologies that impose upon the concept of improvisation that special sense of creative autonomy and uniqueness that so many commentators on music portray as fundamental, and which actually can easily pass without interrogation into the literature on creativity. 
Um, for many years, the anthropologist Paul Richard has studied farming communities in Sierra Leone, where shifting rice cultivation requires dynamic analysis and response in real, if extended time, to changing natural and social conditions. Richard's work shows that improvisation can take place on much larger timescales than the moment, as well as establishing crucial differences between the protected micro-worlds of improvisative art making and the possibility of starvation and death faced by imp improvising farmers in attempting to alter the program or flip the script. The computer scientist Philip Agre maintained that if contingency is really a central feature of the world of everyday life, computational ideas about action will need to be rethought. Uh, Agre further asserted that, quote, activity in worlds of realistic complexity is inherently a matter of improvisation, and by inherently, I mean that this is a necessary result, a property of the universe, and not simply of a particular species of organism or a particular type of device. In, partic in particular, it's a computational result, one inherent in the physical realization of complex things. Now, Agre proposes a view of improvisation, this is in the 1990s, as, quote, a running argument in which an agent decides what to do by conducting a, a continually updated argument among various alternatives, individuals continually choose among options presented by the world around them. Action is not realized fantasy, but engagement with reality. In particular, thought and action are bound into a single continuous phenomenon. Now, in, in reviewing, in, in, in preparing for this talk tonight, I found a lot of congruence between this view from computer science and Michael Shadlin's work on decision making, which is also concerned with finding motivations for complex behavior. In any event, one notes in this newer kind of work on improvisation a very different viewpoint on the relation between the indeterminate and the improvisative. Rather than imposing a distinction between the two based on directed, intentional acts of aesthetic choice, these non-artistic theorists portray indeterminacy as an aspect of everyday life that is addressed improvisatively. Also absent in this expanded context are ideological debates common in musical research concerning whether or not improvisations must inevitably rely upon preset, memorized formulae, rules, cultural models, etc. Finally, in much of this work, freedom and structure are not taken as oppositional. Rather, it's structure and freedom, as well as power, agency, and constraint become emergent in improvisative interaction. Um, so I don't know what I'll, I think I'll do the blindfold test now. This is a blindfold test for two pianos. We'll get into that. Just play a little bit of it. recent years, neuroscience has been one of the key areas in the scientific study of musical improvisation. While jazz in one form or another has been central to much of this research, significant work has also been done on musical improvisation in non-jazz genres. I mentioned uh, here recent work by John Sloboda, a cognitive psychologist in collaboration with musical colleagues, using EEG analysis to observe brain responses by both performers and listeners to compose and improvise music making in a putative, putatively Western classical genre. Comparative analysis revealed that during the improvised performances, according to the abstract, the musicians showed less activity in cortical areas associated with sustained attention and more activation of motivational areas and areas related to free will, as well as planning and coordination of movements. The improvised performances resulted in greater activation of areas for motor planning and both performers and audience members. Even more remarkably, despite not having heard any of the music before, listeners could regularly detect the improvisation and rated them as more innovative in approach, more emotionally engaging, more musically convincing than the non-improvised regular performances. In fact, there's no reason at all not to regard the listeners as improvisers as well. 
very interesting 2013 essay by Melinda McPherson and Charles J. Lim, who have published prominently on the neuroscience of jazz improvisation, takes as its title, Difficulties in the Neuroscience of Creativity, Jazz Improvisation, and the Scientific Method. The author's understanding is that the study of jazz improvisation provides, quote, one of the most useful experimental models for the study of spontaneous creativity. The authors rightly observe that the scientific study of creativity and the creative process itself poses enormous difficulties in establishing experimental controls and constraints, but they feel that these issues can be overcome. Now, uh, the author's notion of creativity is summarized here. Quote, although not all creativity takes place within the domains of art, it does appear that the domains of art are always areas characterized by enormous creativity. In a sense, artists are creative experts, highly trained in the skills needed to enable creative states of mind that can offer scientists a golden opportunity for study. Now, this understanding is what we've actually come to expect from arts-oriented framings of improvisation. The notion that the practice is more often than not the province of de designated super people with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. And in fact, this is the justification that the authors use for studying jazz, a field of music now officially deemed as creative and even, according to the authors, arguably the most developed and advanced form of musical improvisation, a decidedly non-scientific judgment that, as the ethnomusicologist Nico Higgins discovered, a large majority of Indian fusion jazz musicians, more interested in John McLaughlin than in John Coltrane, might take issue with. And then, where is the ide ide why, what, there's the ideological vision of the notion of advanced. Is jazz more advanced than the blues? Is Boulez more advanced than Beethoven? Uh, Mihai Chicks at Mihai and Grant Rich in an article on improvisation observed that judgments on creativity are made by two groups. First, a domain or symbolic system, which is defined by, quote, some group entitled to make decisions as to what should or should not be included. And second, the field, composed of so-called experts who, quote, rely on past experience, training, cultural biases, personal values, and idiosyncratic preferences. Under such a regime, Creativity is pretty much what authorized entities say it is, and thus subscriptions of creativity can be decidedly political, the outcome of a communitarian or even institutional theory. So what I imagine from reading, there was that thing, Michael, you made about giving the monkeys what the four tasks, what it was. What I, you know, you know what you want to talk about? What I, I tried to read it, you know, it was tough, but <laughs> what I imagine from reading this work, it's, it, it, it's that, well, I'll, okay, here's the blindfold test is now kind of uh, done. I think we, we can tell you what's happening now. But first, well, that's an article I'm not going to have time to talk to you about. That's uh, Chris Frith and Uta Frith, who I was on a, panel with in, uh, in, in 1996 and talking about theory of mind and the ideas of involuntary and voluntary signaling, signaling and what they were calling um, uh, social cognitive neuroscience. We're not going to have time for that, but I'm going to do a little revealing here. Okay, this is the blindfold test. The blindfold is taken off and um, here we go. Just to explain that briefly, um, Jerry Allen and this computer program that I made a few years ago, one of many I've made over the past 30 years or so, um, are sort of listening to each other and exchanging information and they're both playing piano, so there you go. So that's why I could get away with blindfold tests, maybe. But what I imagine from reading Michael's work on this, instead of treating my friend and colleague, Jerry Allen, to the tender administrations of fMRI, one could instead choose a random sample of differently abled people to perform simple, well-designed tasks that oblige spontaneous, improvised uh, choice. Doing so might present an opportunity to avoid the data noise that the consensual ideology of the special creator introduces into the experimental results. 
I wondered if that might be a way for scientists to tease out those everyday forms of improvisative creativity that Gilbert Ryle observed. I mean, I remember asking an earlier generation of AI theorists a related question. I mean, creating machines that can write fugues, that constitutes one proof of concept for one type of model of what it means to be human. But a machine that can improvise, you know, like the Mars rover, I think that's the, the best improvise, machine improviser in the solar system right now. Um, constitutes a, quite another, and one in my view, that comes a lot closer to everyday human experience. As it happens, you know, in fact, oh, it's only recently that some scientific papers on subsumption-based robot architectures, they gingerly refer to the actions of the machines as improvised. So I think this revised approach would assert a very different model of creativity, even encompassing computational creativity, from an emphasis on the study uh, moving away from the emphasis on the study of certified, if in the case of jazz only relatively recently so, cultural practices, an in in ideology which to be fair is majoritarian in the study of creativity. You know, it makes sense. You know, if you study creativity, you study creative people. You know, you hack the banking system because that's where the money is. But could we learn just as much about creativity from studying humans in the pursuit of an improvised task for which there is no prior refined practice or cultural support. To use Lydia Gurr's remarkable, new formula, remarkable formulation, scientific study could provide new perspectives on what she calls not only improvisation extempore, or what happens, quote, when musicians make up music and performance from this moment forward, but also improvisation impromptu, what we do at singular moments in the moment when we are put on the spot, particularly though not only when we are unexpectedly confronted with an obstacle or difficulty. We are, we are improvising music extempore, perhaps, when we are performing works, or indeed when we are engaged in any other sort of artistic or life activity. So here improvisation and adaptability become fused as a spur to a study of creativity with two novel, yet I think supportable assumptions. First, creativity is always within us and all around us. Second, at any node in a network that features a combination of indeterminacy, agency, choice, and the analysis of conditions, we will find improvisation and, in some sense, uh, life itself. That's it. Thanks.